welcome from and thank you very much for availing yourself. I was worrying a bit that you might be uh, having cold feet and deciding to show up. I believe that you're here. Uh, I'd just like to thank you and congratulate you for having gone through the uh, process up to this stage. And I think this is one of the uh, crucial stages as well of the process, you know, to form and create you know, the final you know, selection. From the process point of view, we're going to give you about 30, uh, 30 minutes for your presentation. After that, there will be 15 minutes of our QA. Um, and then we're going to break into uh, different constituencies. And then uh, and we'll see you this afternoon for the interview with the committee. Yes, Cold feet, that's not Spitz's way of doing things at all. So here I am. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jeff, for the opportunity to present and for the committee for short listings. A special thanks to my colleagues here this morning who have made time to be with me this morning and to listen to what I'm um, about to put forward and articulate. The selection committee has given us, or certainly given me, a very focused topic. And the topic is to put forward an agenda for HR advancement and transformation in the South African context and with particular reference to this. What I'm going to do a little bit is not just focus on the reference to South Africa and to this, but also to just provide contextualized this in the higher education sector. For those of us who are working in higher education for as long as I have been, we're very clear that we're operating in a world order that is quite hostile to higher education in general. So you find that economically there's um, serious problems with the world economy in general and the economies of countries in particular. Um, at the social level, you'll notice that governments are pursuing policies, anti-immigration policies that polarize society even more than we've seen any time. In addition to the economic decline and this kind of polarization, there's also the issue around uh, geopolitical problems in the world, uh, America and China, America and Israel, in America and Iran, America and Turkey. Take note, one country in common in all of that. So a changing world order that's quite hostile for global higher education as well. Now, the issues that I'll articulate about global higher education pertain to higher education in the region and certainly in our country. <coughs> higher education institutions, particularly good universities, are having to contend with uh, challenges on multiple fronts. And these challenges relate to a uh, decline in income for universities, a decline in support from governments for universities, and South Africa is no different, and even a while there's a decline in um, economic support for universities, there's an increase in intervention in universities and the life of universities and the academic life of the university. Other challenges that campuses face relate to curricula that are not sufficiently responsive to the diverse population that are in universities today. And of course, campuses that are polarized um, along lines of race gender, political differences, and so on. Now, WIT is operating in that context, that global context, and that local context. In South Africa, you know that there's the enduring problem of student accommodation, high debt for student affordability, cynicism from um, um, business to say that university degrees are not sufficiently preparing our graduates or for the economy and for the workplace. Wits has been operating particularly in that environment, and yet I have to say that Wits University is an extraordinary university. I've been here for a very long time, starting out as a student in the late, uh, late, late 70s, when I had to write a letter with my father to the minister to allow me to study here instead of having to go to a university in Germany. So for me, this is close to my heart. I see all this beauty, but I see its faults as, as well. Let me give a very brief picture about Bits University and the footprint that I know of Bits University. Currently, Bits University is highly regarded globally, 
nationally and regionally for the kind of work that academics do at this university. In fact, members of the Global Academy want to talk to academics from which university because of the nature of the work that our academics are doing. Many of our academics are able to talk to the Global Academy from right here, from Johannesburg. And you're able to do that because of the kinds of questions that you are tackling, whether it's environmental sustainability, whether it's affordable health care, whether it's um, the state of violence in the world, whether it's the politics of human mobility. You're able to do that, and you're able to engage the Global Academy. That's the rich university we know today. On the teaching front, we changing this landscape in the way that we orientate our courses, in the way that we think deeply about revitalizing our courses and decolonizing programs. If you look at directorates in the in which university, whether it's a financial directorate, HR directorate, or occupational health and safety, people in professional, not all I have to admit, but professional directorates are uh, are benchmarkers in their relevant industry. They set standards in their, in their relevant industry. So colleagues from our directorates are asked by the DOHET or by USAF or by ARUA to chair committees that are setting norms and standards for the sector as a whole, or governance structures for the sector as a whole. Often my colleagues in HR are called upon to talk to universities or university staffs around uh, university staff around our recruitment policies, our policies re uh, relating to uh, talent management and um, talent retention. Of course, in having good uh, university academics in the way that I've described, the teaching footprint in the way that I've spoken about, and professional <coughs> visions, our students are not going to be left behind. So almost on a monthly basis, you'll find students from a variety of faculties participating in a range of competitions. Just last week, students in engineering have won a competition in supercomputing. Students in, in, in our faculty participate regularly in debating competitions or chess competitions. Students in other, in other faculties are also participating. The point to be made here is that BITS is a vibrant university, a university that has a fantastic footprint in whatever marker that you're going to choose to use, whether you're going to use the research mark as a marker or marker in terms of our public intellectual role. Think about the public intellectual role that academics are playing all of the time. I think particularly about the influence we've made on the sugar tax. I think about the influence we're having at the moment as we talk about national health insurance. So BITSIs take their role seriously, not just in, on the academic front, but also in the role of being a public intellectual. We <coughs> take our role in public life seriously. Yeah, colleagues, when I look at um, institutional culture surveys, when I uh, listen to <coughs> conversations at um, university forum, when I talk to you in passing, then what I hear is a staff that is divided, a staff that is experiencing a trust deficit, uh, relationships between um, labor and management are suffering from a trust deficit, lack of loyalty, and a feeling that inside of this all is not well. Now, how then would an incoming DVC attend to this problem, this internal external problem, and make bits whole again. And for me, the key question then will be, how will I leverage this particular portfolio and the functions in this portfolio in the service mm -hmm. of this university, in the service of revaluing all that we stand for? As an incoming DVC, if I was successful in this position, first priority for me would be uh, the value proposition of the university. What do I mean by reinvigorating this value proposition? It means a recommitment colleagues to the intellectual project of the university that all of us support, that all of us know, and that all of us want to have thriving. In other words, the key 
key value that supports um, uh, academic excellence. But inside of revaluing, there's also got to be a re-energizing uh, re of the administrative and the uh, administrative project of this university. And that means a commitment to systems and processes that support not just people, but also, and not just the academic project, but also students who are on the receiving end of the academic project. We need to recommit ourselves to being kind and collegial to each other and to ourselves. It is my considered view that in increase in invigorating the values, each one of us is going to have to recommit ourselves to the larger purpose of why we are here. <coughs> of course, we represent different constituencies. Of course, we have differences. Of course, we come to the intellectual project from different perspectives. But we have one thing in common. And what we have in common is the bigger purpose of why each one of us are here. And in fact, Gritsies are known to take not just the intellectual project seriously, but the values of building society more broadly. the values of which university working collectively, because this is not a, something that one person can do. It's a recommitment from each one of us. A key function in this portfolio is HR. And I believe that HR provides us with ample opportunity to do this. It refocuses our <coughs> attention on bits and its people. Now, HR does quite well. I've mentioned to you that um, 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 Colleagues in HR are called upon um, to chair committees that are national committees. Um, they called upon to share policies. They called upon to share um, ideas that we have around talent management and so on. But I do think that if we take reinvigorating the value seriously, HR is an opportun opportunity to shine. HR is an opportunity to up its game. And HR is an opportunity to refocus on the people of Bits. There are three priorities here that I'll look at inside of um, um, focusing on people. The first relates to policies, and I think this is relatively easy to do. We have good policies, which could be made better. We could communicate the uh, policies much more clearly than we do. We could make sure that policies are easily accessible. So sometimes at a given time, you can go onto the website and find two policies relating to the same issue. It's confusing for managers, it's confusing for people who are on the receiving end of policies. My own experience in policy development in education tells me that policies are best understood in terms of practices on the ground. It's one thing designing the policies. It's more important ensuring that the people who have to implement the policies understand the policies and are able to engage with the, with the policies. To my mind, we have to report not just upwards, but downwards, work, work much more closely with faculty staff than we've done before. As far as I can see, the policy, the policy terrain is easy to do, very quick, and a quick way for HR and HR to focus on the same people. An area that I think is a huge gap at this university, and it relates to health and wellness or health and wellness services. Often in recent weeks, I've been hearing about high levels of absenteeism in services division due to um, ill health. We also, in recent weeks, have lost two colleagues um, among the cleaning staff. And I have come to hear that, in fact, those colleagues were not even aware that they were, they were carrying an illness. Um, a health and wellness program that focuses on personally speaking is going to be crucial. What I've done in the last few weeks is to spearhead an initiative to understand from a variety of um, stakeholders, um, academics, labor, um, managers, and so on, about what is understood by wellness, what do people expect in a wellness program, 
and what do we have and what do we need. I've come to see that quite a lot is happening across the campuses, but it's happening in silos, it's happening in an uncoordinated way, and it happens on one campus and not on the other campus. Um, my, this consolidation at, um, initiative um, has shown me that actually we now need to sit down and see what is it that we have and what more that we need in relation to what I've in relation to the information that I've garnered from colleagues across the university. The one thing about wellness that I've come to understand, that it's not a wellness day or a wellness week or a wellness month that I'm going to have to work on if I was successful in this position. It's a wellness culture that each one of us needs to be from front and each one of us needs to collectively own. My colleagues in psychology will tell you the best treatment towards wellness for an institution is the treatment that we give to each other. It is the treatment that you and I give to each other and is a treatment that we give to ourselves as being members of this community in this. So if I were appointed to this position, a wellness service and wellness initiative will take much of my time, but I will make sure that I work with colleagues to ensure that the wellness service and the wellness program is sufficiently responsive to the needs of individuals, that is enjoyable, and that it allows for individual agency to be able to participate in that program. The third pillar in this kind of reorientation that I'm suggesting for HR focuses on talent recruitment. Now, talent recruitment, every good university deserves to attract the best talent when it comes to staff and when it comes to students. But there's a side to talent recruitment that we need to take seriously and engage with much more vigorously. And that is the talent that we have inside already. What are we doing with the talent that's right here, that's working in this ever-changing workplace? To that end, I think there are three elements that HR can take very seriously. The one, the one focuses on staff planning. Now, if I was successful in this position, I would ensure that every division focuses on a, on a staff plan that is appropriate for the staff in that particular division of school and that collectively is served the university. The second area that I would work really hard on would be to make sure that the staff plan aligns with our skills plan. Annually, the Human Resource Division puts together a skills plan for the university. But it's not often that the skills plan talks to the staff plan. And that alignment is going to be crucial. But the third and immediate focus is going to have to be on thinking about the learning paths, learning development, and learning trajectories of colleagues who've been recently insourced into the university. We're going to need to think seriously about that cohort of people at which university. Now, we do quite a lot in terms of staff development for academic staff, and I'll talk about that when I get to the transformation priority. But professional development needs attention, and I've come much more alive to it in the last few months that I'm working much more closely with professional and administrative staff um, um, uh, at the level of the university more broadly. Colleagues, what I'm proposing for HR is really an HR orientation that is less transactional and much more transformational, much more transformative in how it thinks about the people at which university. Now, this is going to come at a cost. We're working in a resource intensive environment, in an environment at which university in particular, where operational costs are rising year on year. How are we going to begin to resource what I'm putting forward? How are we going to begin to even implement what I'm putting forward? And this then brings me to a priority that I'd like to focus. And this is advancement. It's an important function in this HR portfolio. And I'd like to position advancement 
as committing to sustainability, long-term, medium-term, and short-term sustainability of the university. What we currently have as advancement are five units that do that work quite nicely on their own. <coughs> they work very well in silos. They do their well. They work particularly well. So you have marketing, you have communication, you have uh, events management, you have development and fundraising, and you have alumni relations. Again, the standard bearers in the industry. If you think about alumni relations and the WITS review that they publish on a regular basis, has been the recipient of many awards. If you look at our communication division, it gets nominated and shortlisted for awards in the sector and in a variety of categories. If you look at development and fundraising, we do pretty well. We're able to um, get support from the university, uh, mostly from corporates, mostly from corporates. Now, of course, we can stay that way and continue to do our work and be business as usual. But if we want to think about seriously about the sustainability of the university, we're going to have to think seriously about how advancement repositions itself as a coherent, integrated unit that has a philosophical change and a change in orientation about what it thinks about fundraising. If I were appointed to this position, I would first and foremost dedicate my attention to an integrated unit across these five divisions. I would ensure that the five divisions work as a single unit on advancement. And colleagues, make no mistake, I'm not suggesting fuzzy, warm collaborations here. I'm really suggesting an integrated unit that aligns itself firmly to the strategic priorities of this university and those relate to the intellectual and academic project of this university. I'm focused, I would focus on shared resources and shared services. Now what would that look like by way of example? It would mean that we reorientate ourselves, not as fundraisers, but as garnering support for the intellectual project of this university. When you change the orientation from fundraising to garnering support for the intellectual project, it has a different meaning about advancement and how we advance this good university. So that will mean the following. Alumni relations does really well in sustaining our relationships with our students once they've left the university. And an advancement unit that I'm proposing, alumni is going to have to tackle your students long before they even come to the university. In other words, work very closely with the student liaison division downstairs to make sure they understand where are these students coming from, who are they, and not wait till they've left and then establish our relationships. That same alumni unit, unit is going to have to work much more closely with the careers unit. It's going to need to make sure that it focuses on career paths for students when they are here. It focuses on career fairs for students when they are here. I would love to see a career fair for students in the humanities. It's easy to do it for students in engineering because there's a ready industry out there. It's easy to do it for students in health science. There's a ready, ready industry out there. I'd like to see much more of that. So an integrated advancement unit is going to reorientate itself and alumni relations is going to need to focus on that element. DFO is going to need to rethink its philosophical orientation in the way that I've suggested. It's about garnering support for the intellectual project. When you garner support for the intellectual project, you need someone who's leading this portfolio who has a profound understanding of the intellectual project. Now, which university, as some of you may know, has committed itself to the centenary campaign. Frankly, the centenary campaign is changing the direction of the university in terms of how it's beginning to think about sustainability. With the centenary campaign, there's a focus on, with the centenary campaign, there's a focus on um, 
changing our direction from corporate to focusing on high net individuals. Now, to garner support from high net individuals is completely different to how you would garner support from corporate. And actually, as a division, we're going to need to reskill and upskill if we're going to start thinking about garnering support from high net individuals. So, on this priority of sustainability, I'm really proposing an integrated advancement division that transforms how it thinks about itself and the work that it does in relation to sustain this university in the short term, medium term, and long term. This takes me to the last priority that I would put forward if I were appointed to this position. And that relates to WITS as a place for each one of us. The transformation story at WITS is a rather interesting one, actually, as I'm beginning to look in the last little while. I noticed that there have been three iterations of transformation at WITS University. And in some ways, they resemble the iterations of how transformation is developing in our society more broadly. So some 15, 17 years ago, may even be a little bit less or a little bit more, the idea around transformation focused on reconciliation, focused on institutional culture, focused on relationships that need to be developed in a university that was operating in a divided society. So that first iteration of transformation was quite interesting and focused mainly at a high level within the university, focused on reconciliation, focused on institutional culture. The second iteration, very interesting iteration, was about 10 years ago, where the focus was on transformation, but it focused now particularly on making the environment conducive for women academics to thrive in the academy. So the focus was on women, and particularly personal development of women, and academic development of women, and there was a university transformation committee. You'll notice that the structure has also changed. Initially, there was a, um, a sort of conciliation from, um, uh, committees that would look at institutional culture. We now had an institutional transformation committee. The last iteration that I want to focus on is what we've done in the last five years. And we focused on sort of nine <coughs> transformation pillars. And what you see, what you see here is a move not just on people, on women, but on place, on language, on curriculum, and on residence. Structurally, we now have a transformation implementation committee. We have a transformation um, uh, uh, transformation committees at the level of faculty. We have transformation steering committee. We have regular reporting on transformation to the university committee and to the university forum in particular. So you see a significant change and uptake of transformation in, along these um, uh, uh, along these uh, lines. But I believe that if I were appointed to this position, there's an opportune moment now to reposition ourselves in terms of transformation. We're starting to understand transformation in its multiplicity of ways around curriculum and so on. But there's an opportunity now to think or at least put forward a social justice agenda for the university. We have a transformation office. We have a gender office, and we have a disability rights unit. I think there's a moment to put forward a, trans, a social justice agenda that takes discrimination and inequality in all its forms and looks at it together. If I were appointed to this position, I would review the processes and the programs we've run for the last five years, but in the context of our 15-year or 18-year history with transformation. I would work in a consultative way to understand which of these initiatives have worked, what more do we need, and how else do we need to focus. And I would work with colleagues to reformulate transformation programs that have social justice agenda at its core. 
Now, colleagues, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, and I'd like to point out that any DDC taking this position uh, would focus on HR transformation and advancement would have to keep their eye on the agenda that, in the way that I propose, but also in terms of the future. So HR, for example, can certainly work on a wellness plan, can certainly work on defining its policies, and can certainly work on talent management. But it's going to have to keep its eye on the changing nature of work and the changing nature of workplaces. The future of work is not a theoretical question that my colleagues explore in humanities or in CLM. It is a reality that we face in this university almost today. So the HR division is going to have to refocus its attention. And by refocusing its attention, it means thinking about the future of work is going to impact on the policies or, or the staff plan that I spoke about earlier. It's going to impact on the skills development plan that I spoke about earlier. Equally, advancement is it's going to reposition itself in the way that I've articulated here. An integrated university that thinks about changing its strategy, thinks about changing its orientation. It's going to have to think deeply about African philanthropy, or African philanthropies for that matter. What are the limits of this philanthropy? What are the possibilities that this kind of philanthropy offers us if we're going to use advancement as an important dimension um, in this portfolio. And finally, an integrated social justice division is going to need to keep a very keen eye on new forms of asymmetries, new forms of inequality that may emerge, even new forms of divisions that may emerge from progressive technology. Colleagues, I'm going to conclude chair five more minutes and I'll be done. And that is, what do you get if you appoint me as your uh, as, as the DDC? I have to declare upfront I'm a pirate supporter, so that may, <laughs> <laughs> that, that may, that may be a deal breaker. But, um, I'm hoping you can set aside our difference on that score and focus on what I bring to this task. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> What you get if you appoint me as your DDC colleagues is someone who has a profound understanding of the intellectual project, a deep respect for the different disciplinary traditions that operate in this good university. I understand systems and administration extremely well. I'm hands-on and highly efficient administratively. I'm able to work administratively without making this portfolio administrative. There's a big difference. The difference is that I understand this portfolio will require leadership, management, and administration. And I see a distinction between leadership and management. What you also get if you appoint me as your DVC, you get someone who's deeply committed to Wits University, a Wits University that is whole. On this score, I'm inspired by Edward Said on his view of the academy. And in fact, if you buy into this view of the academy, which inspires me, and I would argue that each one of us sitting here deserves a bit that we can call our own. Thank you, colleagues. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Osman, for that very inspiring 
um, overview, I wonder, I have three quick questions. The first one is that um, you put a, place the central role on the, or central emphasis on the role of managers. But students and academics are often at the receiving end of managers. So I wonder if you could comment on how, what do you envisage to be the links between your office should you be successful, and on the one hand students, and on the other hand academics. Uh, the second one is also in relation to talent management. Um, what we often find as, a, as the academy is that there's a lot of talk, but very little actual listening to what um, academics or students um, say. And then the third one, although you started off by talking about the regional, the national, regional, and international context, a lot of your um, focus areas relate very much to bits, um, and you didn't really talk about how you see those plans unfolding into the national and international domain. Um, more questions. Thank you very much and thank you Professor for the presentation. Um, you referred to the trust deficit uh, and uh, it seemed as if a lot of what you were proposing required that trust deficit to have been closed and to be, have been resolved. But I didn't hear enough in your presentation about how you intend to address that. So if you could just respond to that please. Last question. So, Patricia, um, you may have heard the emphasis for managers, but in fact I concluded and began with the idea of a deep commitment to the intellectual project of the university. And in fact, the intellectual project of the university is made up not just of academics and students, in fact they are key people in the intellectual and academic project of the university. But the way I see the intellectual project of the university includes the administrators and professional staff who administer uh, the programs that make up the intellectual project of the university. When I make reference to um, staff, it will have to be inclusive of the drivers who drive students across campuses, the persons who are cooking in the kitchen, the persons who are keeping our gardens clean, and of course, the academics who are uh, conducting life-changing um, research in the laboratories. So when I talk about managers, um, um, I'm, or at least if you heard my reference only to managers, and I do think that this role in particular, why is going to foreground the intellectual project of the university? going to have to work very closely with managers at all levels to ensure efficiencies in that regard. Um, if, if I take a specific, um, if I to respond specifically to your question about how one makes it, um, tra how one makes this role um, service um, academic, then I think it's about foregrounding the efficiencies and systems that support the academic project, because the academic project is not in isolation from efficient systems that need to support it. Um, in terms of uh, talent, um, um, oh, let, let, me, let me rather speak to the regional and uh, into, um, you know, the, the regional question, and maybe the talent management. I need you to just um, um, put it forward again. So regional, the regional cooperation or regional um, um, uh, footprint, not just of which university or the academics of, of which university, I think the advancement division is going to have a significant role in strengthening what the university already has, in strengthening um, or reposition, repositioning a research intensity, not just at which university, but in the region and globally. And I'm, I'm not sure um, um, what exactly uh, you, you're referring to when you're talking about the regional partnerships because which university in particular has several partnerships that sustain not just our university but the sector 
in the country, in the sector, in the region. <coughs> we're leading in the region and we're looking for partnerships and we have partnerships in the region. I just think about the Arua partnership, for example, about repositioning or strengthening the positions of research intensive universities um, just in the region and much more globally. Um, on the talent management <coughs> question, um, can you tell, uh, repeat that question for me, the focus of that question, Leticia? No, it's fine. You covered it. Mm -hmm. um, I was asking, it, again, maybe it relates to the trust issue, the importance of listening. Um, ah, uh, and listening <clears throat> between, um, well, so I think you, I have to be frank here. I think you're treating management as senior management. And when I speak about management, I think when you're managing an NRF chair, there's an element of management um, in what you do. If you think about heads of schools, if you think about being a big chunk of what you do is management. I think there is a view that uh, management and senior management don't listen, not just to academics, by the way, but to professional staff as well and administrative staff. Now, how does one begin to listen, or at least give a sense that what is being said is being heard? And I think the proof of the, the proof will really lie in the way that one engages and consults and deals with uh, the issues that arise, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but even on a, uh, at a strategic level. So I'll give you one example, if you don't mind, just as a way of elaborating. The crisis of higher education in South Africa in 2015 and 2016 um, divided the BITS community significantly and divided the faculty of humanities in very particular ways. Um, and I think that my ability to engage with people, my ability to air, uh, listen to people, enabled us to set aside our differences and to refocus our attention in the one thing that we had in common. And the one thing that we did have in common was service to the student and service to the intellectual project. So listening is going to, I think it will play out in time and you'll have to um, watch the space to see what can be done. But there are specific things that one can do um, on the issue of listening. And if you don't mind, I'm going to answer it in the context of the question that you've asked me, um, um, Anthony, on the question of trust deficit. Now, the trust deficit is spoken about very often, but trust cuts, cuts in various directions. It's not just trust of um, 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 uh, labor in relation to management. It's about, in the first instance, identifying what we have in common, and then focusing and developing that that we've committed ourselves to, but then coming to, coming to the project that we've committed ourselves to in a way that is, um, that is invested with integrity and in a way that is invested with the facts on the ground. And I, uh, left, uh, if I were appointed in this position, one of the key elements of strengthening the trust deficit is recognizing that there's um, hierarchical relationships, but there are also relationships, flat relationships that we need to engage with. And th that means that if you and I, for example, are speaking or engaging on wellness, that we come to the task open to opportunities to change positions, open to opportunities to recognize <coughs> what we've achieved and then working together to strengthen that which is not achieved. Trust, as I point out, is, uh, goes in, a, in many directions. It's not something that one group of people engages with another group of people and that's how trust is established. Trust is established taking on the project, whatever that project is, with integrity on both sides. Um, I'm committed to um, um, focusing on the trust deficit. I've heard it often, but it's described very differently. 
from different sectors in the university. And um, it's something that we need to recommit ourselves to. All of us need to recommit ourselves to. And each one of us may need to move an inch forward and shift from the position that sometimes we hold so tightly. Thank you, Professor. I think we'll <coughs> bring this session to and our we'll see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, we've got about five minutes before the next presentation. We'll just take a quick uh, comfort break when uh, we start. Professor Kalanda, thank you very much for being here with us this morning and for availing yourself and putting yourself uh, through the process. I think you've uh, already been briefed in terms of the uh, process of the presentation and the topic uh, this morning you know, to address. Colleagues, just quickly to uh, reintroduce uh, you know, uh, Prof. Kabanda, as I've indicated earlier. He's currently pursuing a postdoctoral degree program with the Doctor of Science in Computer Science with Atlant uh, Atlantic International University in the U.S. Uh, was appointed uh, Prof. Vice Chancellor, Corporate Planning and Business Development at Zimbabwe Open University for nine years. To 2008 until 2017. He's completed his PhD degree in computer science from California Pacific West University in the US. Welcome, sir. You've got a uh, 30 minutes uh, of presentation, after which we'll spend 15 minutes of QA. Thank you. Good, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor to be presenting to you this morning. Uh, I'll be presenting on the approaches to be taken with regards to transformation and advancement in Asia at this university as we look at uh, the higher education system in South Africa. Um, I'll start by just uh, highlighting the three major areas of focus of my presentation. The first one is just to give an analytical exposition of what the issues are all about by talking about transformation. And then I'll go on to present and talk about the approaches to be taken. And I'll zero in specifically on the VIS University, uh, with my understanding of uh, the vision and direction is taking, and, and then conclude it uh, with, uh, with some of the areas and pointers that one could uh, look at with respect to transformation. The introduction to, to this uh, presentation really comes from an understanding of the period before independence, before 1994, where because of what was there, the social and economic structures that were dominated by colonialism and apartheid, there was segregation, uh, there, was, there were some gaps in social structures. And then it came 1994, <laughs> when new government came in place, the democracy coming in, the constitution of South Africa provided a guarantee for education with respect to accessibility and access. And the same constitution also uh, provided specific principles that ensure that there is equality in every dimension in many things that are done. And so we see uh, that uh, this constitution is then further Buttressed, buttressed by the Higher Education Act, one of one of uh, 1997, that really addresses the imbalances that were there before 1994 up to after 1994. So the VIS University is in this environment where we are looking at the history and transformation is coming in to make sure that we address many other things that are there. Uh, I've noticed that uh, the VIS University is well known for 
is uh, excellent research and high academic standards. It is well known for that. And it's an area that uh, we want to build on and strengthen. And this commitment to social justice is also well known. And there are specific distribution factors that uh, the Vision Bet is known for, one of which is to do with these structures with 33 schools, 3,610 uh, courses. Uh, it's a university that has got 33% uh, by postgraduate students. But one of the things that I uh, that distinguishes very much is really the number of 20, you know, of A-rated researchers and NRF-rated researchers as well as distinguished professors of 14. And, uh, and what is also particularly interesting is the rankings at the national level that even 2017 to 2018, uh, it, it was real number one at the local level. And the latest figures I got for 2019 is that the this university is rated at the level 201, between 201 and 250, according to the world rankings that were published just recently. So it's a university that even at the world uh, scale level is doing extremely well, and is known for that. So at a national level, there is a problem, and it's a national problem of transformation where the transformation is not yet fully achieved in the higher education sector of South Africa. And uh, I'll, it is evident by a few things I will point out. And also that uh, the, we also see that, that uh, the advancement opportunities that are there can still be exploited further than what has been done in the past, so that we can be able to tap into resources that are available in the country for the betterment of the education. Um, this particular problem that we see uh, facing higher education in South Africa uh, is supported by a number of things. One of the, co the common problem that is there is, is that there's no clearly defined production function which can be used in higher education in an environment where the transformation is still uh, uh, you know, going on. And I will illustrate that in a, in a minute or so. A lot of research has been done in the past, and uh, this research shows that there are also issues uh, in the higher education sector with regards to the commitment uh, of academic staff and some of the challenges they face and some of the notable challenges which they face uh, at a national level. And there have been some tensions in the past uh, which are a reflection of, of some of the transformation challenges. I think we take note of the, the, the tensions in 2015 and 2016 like uh, the roads must fall, ETC, and also other local tensions that uh, were reported, noticed uh, uh, within this university, including uh, the student strike in uh, February 2019. At a national level, when you talk of uh, a common production function, what I'm saying is that uh, if the transformation progresses well to the level that it should be, it is theoretically poss possible to, to be able to see and be able to see productivity levels from level to level. As we look at uh, the labor that is there, human resources that we have within the universities, together with the capital and resources that are available. So at a national level, we should be able to produce and see productivity levels that move from level to level as, as we go further up. And uh, this transformation problem at a national level uh, is delayed and caused by a number of factors. And some of the, the challenges that we see, there are challenges to do with resources, uh, the resource constraints that have delayed transformation at the national level. And uh, if it is only distribution, they, they have been in the past entrenched power relations, uh, which are contributing factors to that. So when you look at these challenges, they can be broken down into specific factors, which can be isolated. And when isolated, those, it becomes easier at an institutional level to be able to deal with the transformation challenges. Some of these factors include specific approaches to student funding, uh, issues to do with uh, institutional funding, as well as also the, the focus on the university curricula in its pro knowledge production systems to ensure that it becomes more relevant uh, to the context that we are looking at. There have been studies in the past that show that with regards to transformation, the process itself 
uh, you know, was a little bit on the slower side. And, uh, and this can be shown and supported by the statistics on the levels of uh, the composition of, uh, uh, of staff members by race or groupings. And uh, for the period 2003 to 2009, uh, one could see the trend. Uh, and uh, even though it's now it's not only closing up, uh, where you see this blue line showing the Africans, and, uh, and then, uh, then you see the totals there, but this gap is actually narrowing down, and other groups remain uh, you know, uh, at the same level. You see, for example, with other groupings, for example, the Indian composition has remained a constant uh, for that particular period. So we're seeing that the progress towards transformation has been slowed in some ways, but is progressing very well. Um, I caught one publication done by Professor Habib, um, uh, which, which I came across that shows that uh, if you pick up specifically uh, the composition looking at the number of professors who are black, it was slightly less than 10%, and it just has one indication that uh, these are some of the measures that are used uh, by, by groupings, uh, and this is part of the areas one of the areas that is being looked at uh, under transformation, if I understand. <coughs> but transformation is not just about looking at race relations and so on, there are many other factors. Uh, it's not only institutional, one is going to look at related factors, including the, the support and, and the diversity of the academic staff, as well as also other groupings and the quality of what comes out of the institution. So the whole combination of all these factors put together become strategic success factors that will ensure that transformation becomes successful uh, in, a, in a um, Specifically for the VC University, um, there are uh, uh, studies that have shown that uh, at the time, going back three or four years ago, uh, there was an issue in regards to the distribution uh, of uh, access and opportunity as one of the problems facing transformation. And then the second problem also was to do with the gap between the output uh, of the institution, the specifically the institution with regards to expectations uh, at a national level. And there was also an issue to do with the teaching and research that appeared not to be adequately contextualized. There are some of the problems that were highlighted by some researchers uh, in South Africa. But uh, the good thing with this, uh, even though these problems were highlighted, the VC University went on to come up with the transformation strategy in 2017, which has been addressing that. But uh, it is my observation that I think the transformation strategy may still have some more, you know, more work needs to be done to ensure then that some of those gaps are completely filled, especially as you look at issues to do with the language policies and, and dealing with uh, women in particular. <coughs> Corporate governance is about power and uh, distribution of power. And in transformation, one would want to ensure then that the corporate government itself helps to pick up issues to do with those matters to ensure that the structures themselves ensure that uh, uh, we are able to transform the institution in line with the expectations of what was defined by, by the government and the Higher Education Act. And uh, under corporate governance, in support of transformation, there are challenges that people do face, and uh, some of the challenges and causes or issues that one has to deal with include the clarity of the roles of various levels, whether it's a council coming to executive money coming down, and uh, then looking at corruption and other kind of things. There are many factors that have been identified as possible causes or areas that can weaken corporate governance, but as these things get tightened, even at a Global institutional level, uh, the transformation becomes more successful. And uh, we get guidance from the South African uh, uh, Higher Education um, uh, Gazette, uh, uh, Gazette of 2007 that compels institutions to be able to work closely with the both internal and external stakeholders with regards to governance issues. And, um, and there are those factors which I mentioned that uh, the stakeholders, uh, the shareholders, and internal stakeholders are driving the need for, for, 
for, for, for institutional governance in many ways. And there are a number of benefits that can be derived by ensuring that governance uh, is in place and is strengthened uh, in support of transformation. The pragmatic approach to these issues on transformation advancement, uh, even other challenges the university faces, requires one to take a holistic approach uh, in many ways, and uh, where one has to look at it as a bigger problem. And, and this is why I talk of uh, a pragmatic approach to this kind, kind of a problem, where we are looking at making sure then that uh, what is acceptable knowledge and what should be the norm are uh, things that must be based on what has been practiced by academics uh, and even other researchers. And also the issue of values. Uh, I just want to emphasize two issues on this stage. Uh, one of them is to do with uh, axiology, which is about the values. That even in the process, as we look at this research, as we look at the challenges we face as the institution and looking at the future, there is a need to also to, 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 to look at issues to do with, with axiology or value, which teaches us to focus also on the value of what comes out of the researches that we do uh, as an institution. Um, the research strategies that I'm just uh, sharing there are research strategies that are, uh, are institutional research strategies that are already, most of them are already in place, but I just sort of highlight one or two areas uh, that would uh, help uh, us as an institution uh, to ensure then that uh, one, the research excellence itself uh, and the institutional individual research you know, excellence get strengthened in a bigger way. It's important to inculcate a culture. Since the university is a research intensive university, um, uh, it's important to build up on, on that area. And so the knowledge generation and other approaches that we know in including the research excellence framework that can be pursued are issues and focus areas that can, can be strengthened further than the one is um, to guide us into the future as we deal with transformation, <coughs> as we deal with other issues that is stated at a scientific level, uh, there may be need to look at also a scientific view where we look at the way we deliver, uh, uh, the way we teach and learn in a number of areas. And there are just, these are just some of the examples that have been used elsewhere that could help, especially when it comes to the model of delivery and how it can be strengthened in many ways. And I'm just speaking one of them at this stage, and one of which is the, uh, uh, this particular approach uh, of making sure then that we create a community of learning uh, by taking a certain approach, which is uh, quite uh, a constructivist approach, is one way we want to learn from the experiences of the students and others, so that the learning experiences can help also in the learning processes. It's what is done in uh, other modes of delivery, uh, in open and distance learning. And uh, even scientific environments, where even web based in prior science uh, environments are also used. There are a number of approaches that can be used to strengthen uh, the teaching and learning and the support mechanisms uh, that uh, the university will look at. Advancement uh, is, is about collaborative partnerships and focusing on exploring and, and tapping into those opportunities to see what resources uh, can, can be obtained to support the institutional goals and plans that are put in place. And that advancement, the focus that, that is important is to establish collaborative partnerships. And this is an area that I worked on in the past. Um, I was responsible as a global vice chancellor for strategic planning uh, uh, for many years, as well as also the social mobilization and advancement, and other institutional issues uh, uh, in assisting the vice chancellor. So it's an area where, uh, which Resonance world is an area that I'm passionate about and which I will be able to make much, much help. Resource mobilization can be approached in many ways, but one of the key things I can mention at this stage really is that uh, the, the alumina foundations and endowment funds are approaches that are standard approaches. Uh, and uh, the VC University has got an alumina, an alumina uh, office that works very well in this respect. I want to visit uh, this office. Uh, when I come for a conduct visit to Munisa, because I used to work very close with Munisa at my university. And uh, so this kind of approaches can strengthen if those things are not in place, but I believe that can be done. Uh, there are uh, same national centers of, of, of excellence that are already here uh, at this university, one of them, and more can be built. And international output is important. 
and many other things. So in the advancement approaches, we want to broaden, it's important to broaden the social mobility approaches, as well as also looking at ways of strengthening fundraising in many other things. And the focus on the capital campaigns becomes important where we look at specific projects and approaches to raise uh, capital for projects geared for specific projects or infrastructure development issues uh, which are often referred to as capital campaign projects. And this is one area that I would like to make a contribution uh, uh, from uh, other parts of the world that the capital campaign project is part of advancement. It's an approach that can really strengthen the resource mobilization ways of doing that. The this University uh, uh, Strategic Framework 20, in the vision of 2022 is a great vision uh, that will see the university growing to become uh, a leading research intensive university by 2022. Uh, there are a lot of strategies that have been already identified, uh, but some of them uh, may require to be strengthened for them to be implemented, uh, especially for the university to become uh, a world leader in a number of ways. And, uh, I, and I emphasize one or two of them. Um, the internationalization program or strategy itself broadens and ensures that the university is relevant not only locally but also across the borders and working with others. And for this university to become recognized among academics, it's important to take note of uh, the approaches that would make it more uh, successful and become a leader with respect to uh, the international rankings uh, that are put in place. The values of the university, as I have uh, studied and seen, are values that can be quite useful and give the appropriate guidance uh, into uh, the achievement of that framework which has put in place. The academic vision, just my contribution towards that in, in support of transformation as well as also uh, the other initiatives as defined by the framework of the university is just to ensure that uh, the university maintains its position uh, by ensuring that the highest standards are in place and that uh, the, the best students and best professors are there to, for, to ensure that uh, that advancement scholarship uh, is maintained. And other things have already been defined by the framework and not repeat them. Uh, there is a need then, uh, as one looks at that area, to extend it further to make the university more and more relevant to industry and commerce. And this is where modernization and advancement come in with the interest in particular, the focus on the science, technology, and engineering, uh, the approaches uh, that uh, I, I, I am I'm advocating for uh, approaches that have been found to work so well and, uh, and I talk of science, technology, engineering in that particular respect to ensure then that uh, the policy framework and other national initiatives will be strengthened in that regard. Uh, and uh, my background is fairly strong as a scientist in that area, so it's an area where uh, we can make, uh, make contributions and uh, it's guided by council and working with other colleagues in that respect. The technology innovation hubs just one of the approaches again the university uh, could work in wherever the initiatives and approaches in science and technology to work with the local industry but uh, this approach of hubs requires uh, both it requires the institutions working together with industry networks that are relevant as well as also uh, the local entrepreneurs and other social structures uh, to make sure that whatever solutions are discovered by the university those can be implemented by the communities when the investment goes. And we cannot, uh, as you look at the future, the emerging technologies that are inevitable, that are inevitable, uh, that also <coughs> need to be part of uh, the approaches in the future. Uh, and the framework of the vision of 2022 of the university already provides that guideline. But it's important is to make sure then that what, 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 those, those kind of uh, other little details that are there are taken care of. And uh, this includes some of the IT related issues and technology that people talk about, uh, ensuring that infrastructure and facilities uh, are put in place. This is why, uh, in this respect, one talks of Internet of Things, big data, uh, conventions, and other technological advances that uh, people are talking about. The strategic plan, uh, or technology plan, specifically to the university, uh, is a, it's just an extraction of specific focus or advancing the technological trust of the university to make sure then that the university remains a leader with respect to technology 
number of areas. I will share with you one of the observations I picked up uh, on the world ranking. That uh, when you look at the world ranking for this university, though it has done very well, very well in many respects, but uh, the area that uh, the social sciences are actually uh, a leader in respect to, to, to you know international world ranking. But when it comes to physical science and so on, the level is we are, we are a little bit behind social sciences, and this is why it's important to, uh, to also make sure that technology plans are important. As I quickly just finish off, um, the management style that supports the advancement, the transformation, and the future of the university requires us to focus on strategic trusts that is defined by management by objectives or specific corporate objectives that are defined from, from strategic plan of the university. And uh, one would need to ensure then that there is that kind of culture of the philosophy of making sure that collective leadership is in place and, and uh, appropriate leadership uh, supports that. On the marketing side, all right, it's important as part of the advancement to market and increase the visibility of the university uh, by working with established marketers using the digital front, uh, the online digital space, and also creating events that would increase the visibility of the university. And uh, I want to finish off by pointing to um, the world rankings as they have been uh, published recently in the last 24 hours from what I came across, uh, that uh, 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 this university has done so well when it comes to uh, international outlook and so on according to the scores uh, that I picked up and I put in there. And, uh, and when you look at the graph of the performance over the years, you see that uh, it's quite possible for this university to achieve its vision to be among the top 100 as we look in the future. And the financial management just guides us, again, working with the, the responsible uh, people, executive management to lead us to ensure then that uh, the, the goals that have been defined are achievable and, and specific strategies uh, are put in place to support what the institution has already defined to achieve a number of things. And lastly, I would want to mention that when it comes to, to studies of people management, since we are looking at focus on human resources, there is a need to look at specific strategies that address uh, uh, the strengthening of the human capital of the university and building for the future, but also when you look at building the future, one wants to look at making sure that the capacity continues to grow and to comply with the law and focus on building the talent. So in conclusion, I believe that um, I can be able to make contributions with respect to transformation, respect to, uh, to advancement uh, approaches of mobilization, and other specific arms and, and approaches of the university plans. Uh, because of my background uh, as a scientist, the things that I can be able to provide for, and also the development <coughs> in particular of the international profile, the partnerships with other institutions that can be strengthened and broadened, as well as also Thank you, Professor, for a very uh, detailed and insightful uh, presentation. We're going to spend 15 minutes uh, taking uh, some questions. Any questions to Professor Kabanda? Thank you very much, Prof. Kaman, for the presentation. But my question is really more on the clarity side. Uh, you, you place a lot of emphasis on you being a scientist, and you also spoke about SET, science, engineering, and technology. Are you talking about science in its strictest sense, like core sciences, or are you talking about science in its broadest sense? For, for that question, um, I'm talking of science in this broader sense. Uh, we are looking at not just the core sciences, but uh, 
a scientific approach for the entire universities to set them, including even social sciences, uh, so that uh, the university becomes more and more relevant uh, to the challenges we face as a country and also <coughs> make relevant contributions in the economy. So it's just a central one about the politics. Thank you, Prof. <coughs> Excuse my voice quality. Um, you, in your first slide, you've identified, or at least touched on, uh, some protest actions that you've been following. Among them was the uh, labor protest. To to assist you in highlighting what it was about. To a certain extent, it bordered around levels of trust between management and organized labor, mm -hmm. as well as the, 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 the reality among workers thinking that the management of the institution was not listening to them. So the question I would like to ask you, uh, Prof, is uh, how do you intend to work on avoiding <coughs> such? Because we are not about strikes only if there is a core business. And along the way, we have to be seen to be focusing on that and this uh, 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 dispute, etc. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that question. I think the approach uh, that I would uh, propose is an approach uh, you, where you want to uh, reduce the gaps between management and workers and various groups by working very closely, ensuring that uh, the Works Council other groupings are put together. I, I observed that, uh, for example, the academics are not unionized. They are not in specific groupings and so on. And uh, one would want to ensure that issues that affect such groupings and so on are picked up uh, through the appropriate representation, this constant dialogue with management and also consultation with, with council. And then also even issues that affect um, the welfare uh, of staff in general, um, uh, it's always important to be on top of the situation instead of waiting until there's a problem. So there's need for consultations and con continuous dialogue in diff among the different groups, but whilst at the same time also checking the space outside the institution, looking at what is happening within the nation. Uh, because some of the problems could emanate from outside the university, but because it's a common social problem. So if it happens elsewhere, we then need to make sure that in-house, we also are in constant interaction and make sure that we have it to take care of that. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Professor. Uh, just apropos your previous comment, um, I know it does say in the uh, report on transforming higher education uh, in the 21st century that academics are not unionized. But in fact, uh, they are unionized on this campus. There's an academic staff association of which I'm president. So just a correction on that. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Any further questions? We still have some time. some experience in the United States. Uh, the South African uh, higher education system, uh, the levels of its unionization uh, uh, is a very, very different environment from both those cases where you had some experience. And I wonder whether you think that is an advantage or a disadvantage. And secondly, whether your current position uh, whether you would be able to adapt uh, to, uh, if you like, an environment that is so significantly different from both those circumstances where you, where you, where you, where you got some experience. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for that uh, good question. I, I, I believe I'll be able to quickly adapt to the situation um, because of uh, two reasons. 
one of them, um, the experience in Zimbabwe has not just been isolation. The institution that I worked for and other areas, I worked very closely with uh, a lot of South African universities, one of which is UNISA um, uh, and, uh, and other universities uh, within the open distance learning environment. So it gives an opportunity for one to learn and also see the uh, appreciation of what happens in South Africa in many other ways. Um, and then also the participation in a lot of other regional activities uh, within our education with the SARU and so on helped one to appreciate what happens at that particular level. Um, and by working closely with uh, colleagues, uh, academics, researchers uh, within South Africa and others, it helped us to, for me in particular, also to be learning and picking up issues that are from there. Uh, the thing that we learn then from outside our own continent, uh, also area of practices that are slightly different, uh, where we then want us to look at contextualizing that relevant, but it's a challenging uh, approach, but uh, I think I'll be able to adapt because of the proximity that I've had within working very closely within Southern Africa by working with other institutions of Africa and we can be able to learn very quickly about how best to ensure that the challenges that we face in our education are also dealt with. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's a follow-up, Prof. You've identified some gaps earlier uh, when you spoke about formations. But my follow-up question is, uh, in fact, the gap could be wider than you could imagine. However, the, my question will be linked around your intention to close the gap. Let me give you an example, and it's a reality. There, there are some among staff members who felt that um, uh, professional and admin support staff are treated as second best citizens of the university. As such, we will expect the incoming DVC to bridge that gap. How, how do you intend correcting that? The second part of my question is, the relationship between workers, organized labor, and management of the institution is governed by policies uh, and a particular ER framework. How do you intend in the process of bridging the gap to harmonize that relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, question. The first aspect of it, uh, where the professional and admin staff uh, may be treated as uh, second, secondary uh, kind of citizens, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a problem that I'm very much familiar with. Uh, because when I was a pro vice chancellor, um, in my previous job, I was looking after, I saw responsibility to support the vice chancellor on, on administrative issues, and in particular also dealing with non academics uh, and picking up issues. So, issues due right from the recruitment to promotion and other kind of things and so on. And, and so, it's an area that requires um, uh, an approach which is holistic in ensuring that uh, you strengthen the institution by reducing those kind of gaps and picking up issues using the appropriate structure that are already in place that the issue that affects or that staff that are professional and administrative uh, face uh, are picked up early enough, are taken care of, so good appropriate procedures and policies in place uh, guided by a council to make sure that those issues are dealt with. There's a need for confidence building and making sure that those issues are articulated to the highest possible level particular thing with the guidance of council, uh, those issues uh, can be dealt with. It's an area that I, 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 I used to be taken responsible for and I, I could be able to relate very well, especially with non-academic staff, to make sure that the issues are dealt with. The other uh, point or issue you raised uh, in terms of uh, harmonization, um, uh, with harmonization really what you want to do uh, there is to ensure that, that the relationships uh, between um, uh, management and workers uh, is one that is very healthy and one in which uh, uh, people are able to work very close in many ways and reduce the gaps that are there. And so regular meetings, regular consultations and, and, and approaches 
through which stacks would uh, approve the structures. I'm not quite sure what is already on the ground, uh, but similar approaches where the different representative groups uh, can be working very closely and converging on a number of issues. I think I believe that the approach uh, that really I advocate for is one way there's constant dialogue from time to time, ensuring that approaches uh, are put in place to ensure that those issues are dealt with early enough and uh, they are taken care of in consultation to support many other ones. The idea there is to ensure them that uh, there they is it's just a unit of purpose uh, in all the groups, including academics uh, as well as also uh, non teaching staff, to make sure that the university flows together uh, to achieve a common purpose and so on. And a lot of cross pollination and, and heterogeneous approaches to be taken to do that. So I'm just looking at teamwork uh, uh, across uh, different ways so that heterogeneous approaches are taken uh, for the different groups to work together as well. Any other questions, colleagues? If there are no questions, uh, thank you, Professor Kabanda. Uh, we will see you at court three uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th
firmly embedded among the top elite universities. However, I must hasten to urge that VETS must not only be a one-class university, but it must also respond to societal needs and accordingly benefit society at large. Starting with the VETS community, the students and the people that work for this university, charity begins at home. In this case, or rather to rephrase, the charity begins at home to sort of unpack it. We all know that the person's first responsibility is to provide for the needs of their own family. In this case, <coughs> the vet family. Vet must contribute to the advancement of its people, the advancement of the South African society, and the African continent, in addition to advancing knowledge. The Spring, in his book title, The Soul of a University, calls it that there are two questions we should ask about our academic work. The first question is, what are universities good at? And the second is, what are universities good for? <coughs> the first question is about excellence, i.e. being world class. The second question is about purpose. How do universities respond to the needs and demands of society? Uh, can you see the graph? Yes. That illustrative graph shows the ranking of vets relative, and I must emphasize, a non-representative sample of other world universities ranked above it by the World Academic Ranking of Universities, what is known as the Shanghai Ranking System in short. As you can clearly see, just a representative sample, the top 50 is dominated by US universities, including your Ivy League universities, followed by the British Russell Group universities. In the top 50, the US has about 21 universities, and there are six as a group university. And the color, that is the colorful uh, circles, represent uh, bricks. So you cannot clearly see that there is only one British university in the top 50, and only four British universities in the top 100. This is the only British university in South Africa, the only Arua member university, and the only university in the African continent to be ranked by Arua, <coughs> when is the word Arua, for the Shanghai system, in the top 300 university. Surely, vets should be part of this, but certainly not from the last So the slide is ahead of me, but if you look at the curve yeah. here, consistent, you know, that the power that goes up shows it's consistent with the Japanese Kaizen philosophy or continuous improvement and also consistent with the advanced vision. 2022, I believe that we can catapult VETS to the top 100 universities within our lifetime. Equally important, by conducting research that responds to the current challenges faced by civil society, locally and globally, I believe that VETS might just equal, if not surpass, some of the best world universities in terms of social benefit. So I wonder why it exists as the ranking and the size of the bubble is relative to the income of the university. So you can see that if you know it's like Harvard, bubble is bigger, they have over really good, many times the income of beds, which is much smaller. And then on the X axis, it's speculated because no quite <coughs> indicators for that. So what I'm sure is that the beds can actually shift 
to be more impact in terms of societal benefit. And we must need to do that ourselves. May it's possible, it's realistic that we feel uh, our lifetime, which will be about five to ten years, that will climb into the top 100 of the cities. By giving the budget required to move into the top 50, it might be a tall order. So also given that charity begins at home, the future that we aspire for should also be a visibly happy university. Happy in the sense that the vet student and the people that work for this university should be visibly happy. In as much as happiness comes from within, as you can see on the business, that's mine. In as much as happiness comes from within, it is important that vets provide an environment conducive for the people to be happy. Because we all know that happy people are productive people. Having said that, uh, it is fitting for me to take stock and briefly pay some respect for, to this for what it has done well regarding advancement, HR, and transformation. Regarding advancement, VETS has established good alumni relations throughout the world. And still under the alumni portfolio led by Peter Maha, VETS is doing well in routinely organizing functions and events. VETS has also an effective communication function. It is not by accident that the VETS communication services led by Shiona Patera, was a finalist for the 2018 NSTF Award. And it is also a finalist for this year. And I, for one, having been an NSTF finalist, and also currently serving in the panel of experts for NSTF Awards, I know how competitive those awards are. Having said that, I hope and believe that this year, the Vest Communication Services team will win the award this year, come Thursday. I'll be there to congratulate you when we win. <laughs> the, effect the effectiveness of the Vest Communication, it's also evident from compelling annual reports written and compiled with so much verb by Dinesh uh, Sofu. In the face of the austerity environment, diminishing budgets and regulated student fees, VET has done relatively well in fundraising and staying afloat with positive margins or surplus, at least for the last five years. VET has also done well in establishing a rapport and maintaining enduring relationships with fundraisers or funders from different sectors, both locally and internationally. VETS was also recommended for investing over two billion over the last decade. This includes a half a billion investment towards ICT upgrade and integration of technology throughout the institution, including in its teaching, learning, and research program. The technological innovations and a similar for digital innovation precinct, which I visited last year, is remarkable and in tune with the fourth industrial revolution era we are living in. From HR perspective, VET has done well in recruiting top academics. The result of this, especially a steady increase in the quality of research output, including publication of research articles in general science, nature and science, as well as an increase in the number of highly cited researchers, improved the international ranking of vets, at least as measured by the Shanghai system. You will know that since when the Shanghai system was established in 2003, vets was at the bottom of the top 500 university for nearly 10 years. And the hot map moment was in 2014. And I've done the analysis of the Shanghai ranking system. And then that hotamark coincided with highly cited researchers. 
for 10 years, the highest beta fever score of zero, consistent for highly uh, sensitive researchers. And when the number increased to 7.1, immediately vets moved or sort of break the 300 barrier and move to the top. And as we speak, it is the number one type of research that I've emphasized using the Chennai system. Despite to the non-academic staff, vets did well by insourcing approximately 1,500 workers and for also developing a workers' charter. Vets must also be commended by sending a three-year salary deal, which will hopefully provide stability for at least that period. In terms of transformation, Vets could have done much better. However, there's done some inroads, some commendable progress, such as transforming demographics of students. She'll also be commended for investing about 45 million. First, we'll also be commended for investing about 45 million for the diversification of, of the academy, including <coughs> making some appointments to that effect. Vets has also made good progress in renaming some buildings, spaces, and boardrooms as part of a diverse and inclusive culture. Now, how do you overcome the advancement challenges? With a fees must fall campaign, or test and cost a living wage, and budget cut, and budget cut for research, there is evidently a dire need for compelling and sustainable fundraising to, among others, adequately support and provide full cost bursaries to all the students, including the massive major students from undergraduate to PhD level. There is also need to raise funding to pay living wages and performance bonuses, as well as to support career development for staff up to the highest aspired level. There is also a need to fund researchers in large-scale infrastructure. Now, the obvious question is, how and where do we raise the third stream income? The obvious choice will be your alumni and uh, wealthy people Corporates or the private sector in general, uh, the public sector, including the CTAS, <coughs> international governments and agencies, NGOs, PBOs, and university owned enterprises. I think if you go to the vets, even to vets, there's a long list of uh, people who have donated to the vets. So, in terms of the university owned enterprises, such as the Gordon Medical Center, Vets can also as a diversification of those uh, include the development of land it owns and use the money made out of that as a third stream income to support many needy students. The university owned land could also be developed to provide <laughs> subsidized housing for needy staff. Uh, established researchers should also be encouraged to emulate the Vet Productive Health and HIV Institute led by Helen Peace to source mega funds for research, development, and innovation. Still, as part of the advancement in effective stakeholder management, I will ensure impeccable and continuous communication with all stakeholders. I will effectively make advance as a university of choice and encourage all staff and students to be visible and proud ambassadors of the university brand. This is moving really faster than I anticipated, yeah? So in terms of HR strategy, best need a strategy that supports a leading research intensive university. That strategy must be flexible Reactive and responsive. 
That's part of that strategy. Brent must continue hiring and retaining top academics. But it must also grow its own timber by supporting early career and rising academics from within its existing staff so that they can also become top academics. Brent must increase the number of staff with PhD degrees through staff development so that there's a pool of active researchers in order to maintain a healthy staff-student ratio to, for optimal teaching, supervision, and research productivity. VET must also develop and train administrative staff and low-skill staff, low staff with improved retention, career pathing, and succession planning programs so that they can also be promoted eventually to become academics upon obtaining the necessary qualification. That is consistent with the goals of the Employment Equity Act. VETS must ensure equal opportunities and fair treatment in all aspects of employment, including retention, promotion, and advancement. I can't overemphasize the need for a good labor relations, because labor relations is key to the academic project. The HR function must implement employment, employment wellness program with emotional support. The university must also implement strategies that ensure welfare for students, also with effective emotional support. Speaking of effective emotional support for staff and students, in the last few years, we had unfortunate incidences of suicides among staff and students within the South African higher education system, including here at Pets. We all know that last year, around this time in July, in 27, we lost one of the exceptionally talented researchers and a very good friend of mine, coordinator, for many, many years, to suicide. And even here at Pets, last year, we read in the newspapers that two students committed suicide. We also read in the newspapers that as it goes over to 2019, the SRC president, uh, she <coughs> dissuaded one of the students from committing suicide. So an untimely and preventable death of a student or employee of a university is one too many and must be prevented at all costs, by all means necessary. Universities, universities like VETS cannot train doctors, clinical specialists, and allied professionals, health professionals, and yet not provide adequate wellness program and emotional support for its own staff. In the same breath, VETS cannot only manage and train town planners architects, quantity surveyors, project managers, in Hedman, property laws, and not develop land to provide decent accommodation to meet needed employees at subsidized or zero rate interest rate. That's part of a research strategy that supports a leading research intensive university. VET must inculcate a culture of high performance, productivity, and self actualization among all employees and students. I'm coming back towards the end. I'm going to speak of transformation. It's quite low as we know. We know the broad definition of transformation. Many things. It's not just about uh, the demographics, it's also about language, culture, and I think, you know, like there's about eight points. You know them, I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. But what I want to say is that it's <coughs> essential to sustain academic excellence. And for this reason, following a consultative process throughout the university, it is important that VET come up with a transformation charter, which will be adopted by all staff and students. But in parallel, it must also give impetus 
in the implementation of the best transformation plan. As part of the implementation process, REST need to foster and lead ongoing focus group dialogue and discussions on all aspects of transformation across the university. From the demographics aspect, of course, REST must needs to continue diversifying the academy, but also know that transformation is not only about access or representation, it's also about retention and success of historically disadvantaged individuals. So in order to achieve that, we need to implement targeted recruitment, development, and retention, as well as succession planning programs for historically disadvantaged individuals. The most inclusive participation of underrepresented demographics at a professorial and set level, senior executive team level. In order to attain, look, I think I'm on the, I think the next slide, we want to ask the is this moving too fast. Uh, in ensuring diverse and inclusive participation in the academic project and knowledge enterprise, that's what to foster an <coughs> inclusive university where there is diversity of thoughts and ideas. That also needs to nurture collegiality, it needs to recognize and respect difference and celebrate diversity. That is very much laid the foundation for a university that is united in its diversity, consistent with our code of arms motto, So having just spoken the Christian language of the camp people, there is an urgent need. There is an urgent need to deepen or to address the language dynamics and keeping curriculum transformation. There is also an urgent need to address institutional culture where everyone would feel welcome. <coughs> we need to appreciate that advancement, that advancement of the transformation agenda is the responsibility of all. However, to accelerate the demographic dimension of transformation, including diversification of the academy, the implementation of the Employment Equity Act, and the advancement of designated groups, uh, especially within the senior university status, it must be part of the performance uh, agreement for all blind managers. I can see the chair is here. I was going to talk about portfolio coherence. Oh, I still have to Thanks. You can a little bit. So, if you look at the ART portfolio, uh, at a glance, it, it appears as if there's many functions that seem disparate. However, a common denominator is that the HRT portfolio is about people. It's about people as students, about people as employees and colleagues, about people as alumni, donors, funders, and supporters of the higher education. It's about effective communication internally and externally. And in terms of my management, administrative, and leadership, I will always act with integrity in the best interest of the university at heart. Given that VET is an academic environment, collegiality is an important value. My style is open and consultative, but decisive. Efficient, effective, and responsive. I believe in engaging colleagues, staff, and students to get sound input for good decisions. I manage empathy and compassion. I reflect on decisions gone wrong and recalibrate. I believe in and I have an ethical and inspirational leadership style, which is predicated upon very driven decision making aligned to organizational values vision, and mission. I am going to end, uh, Chair, but I'd like to end with an adaptation of an excerpt from one of my favorite poems. 
by one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, and in 1983, Nobel Laureate in Literature, William Butler Yeats. I am well aware that most, if not, of, not all of you, as staff and students of this university, you do not have the heavens and velvet cloth to spread under my feet. Therefore, as a DVC, I will bread softly, or I will be ready for the dreams. Thank you. you made stating that there's a desperate need for compelling and sustainable funding to adequately support all needy students from undergrad to PhD. I want to know what um, structures will you put in place that but currently has not? What will you def what would you do differently and what do you mean by adequately support? Thank you. Yeah uh Yes, like I said, I, I have made some comments for, for what this is really done, but I think one of the things that I proposed that is not yet in effect is the diversification of the chemistry income. And I pointed out that we know we hear about, we hear about it in the newspapers and regionals all the time, but that's only land, right? So, like, why don't they develop that land and deposit it on the students? And, uh, well, it's and also the researchers, the student for postgraduate students, they must build scholarships in their proposals. As a chair, and then as a director of the executive, an executive director of the psychic chairs, we allow for that. If a two fair of any kind that goes to the psychic chair, it's mandated that it goes uh, towards supporting students. So all other researchers outside of the Sachi and TOE school can do likewise. Need the students, uh, what is the word again? Uh, a full cost. Is that what you were saying? Adequately. So, adequately is full cost. You cover everything. You cover tuition fees, you, you cover uh, living expenses, uh, computer. Uh, and waiting for the NRF, you know, we now have a funding policy, a new funding policy for postgraduate students. And I know that the direct executive director is responsible for that. For Mila Maharaj, has been here to this university. That has also been presented at the DBC forum on what it means to cover all students. So that the students, because most students end up moonlighting, doing other things instead of focusing. So you have everything. And there are values which are in the slant. That's what I mean by that. By, by, by focus. Yeah. Thank you. you. One of your slides, you make reference to an urgent need to address institutional culture. I think it was towards the latter end of your presentation. Yes. Can you perhaps share with us how practically or pragmatically <coughs> you would do something that would address the urgent need of fixing our institutional culture? Yeah, I think one way I, I did this in the way that you come out here is to make everybody welcome. It's about the diversification of thoughts and ideas. You know, it's about uh, uh, respect. And I don't think that's how it should be about. It should have, and also I spoke about the, uh, the drafting of the transportation charter. It was also drafted that you have all those elements. And people must buy each bit. And by buying each bit is to pledge, to pay the pledge. And a very good example of the charter that I've gone through, I think it's from the UK's 
and in terms of transformation, I think it's done fairly well. And it's because of that, because everybody buys and owns that. And you know that there is minimum tolerance to any form of discrimination, and we believe in the diversity of those ideas. And then we are still as a best way to do it. More than Remember that I'm in charge in the funding perspective of more than 250 such chairs. Some of them are sitting here. So those are the And those chairs are hosted by nearly all the university universities. There's a lot of complexity, complexity there, but they deal on a daily basis. And I didn't see a lot of people that are quite good here. I don't see that, I don't see it all, but it is a serious. There's a lot of complexities. Remember, it's not only things. I had a better perspective. Writing with different universities, traditional universities, comprehensive universities, use the universities of technology. So it's quite complex. In addition to that, I deal with uh, the COEs, the speaking of the work. And I sit in the state of the to all those similar concepts. So I have a very intimate understanding because you provide strategic foresight for those movements. And by the way, NRF, as small as it may sound, we have all the challenges that we do face in the university. We have challenges of transformation. And you might know that we have crafted a transformation framework. We have challenges with labor. We have a very strong the how presence. And we push them to them all the time. But because of our prudent way of engaging with them, Fortunately, since I've been there, we never had any strike because of that institution. And in the past, I've worked in this case, I have for 10 years. It was a very complex environment. It was very much akin to the university. As a matter of fact, some of the best researchers here at Vets have put up on this case, I have. Antonio Pedro Pops, a writer. Uh, 
Osimana, Bob Scholes, Osimina. I'm talking about uh, uh, Nozipo Moloto, who we just made a chair, uh, did brain for that matter. So the law is very, very much similar. You know, it may not be a university, canonical university, but it's very much similar in terms of knowledge advancement, in terms of human capacity development. So, so I have that experience. I have also a good opportunity. And the uh, challenges are very much serious. It is also a second university. Very much similar to to the event. So uh, uh, I can help you say I have more of the experience. Okay, the environment that I've been working with is much more important. Jim, you know what I you're doing with one university, you're doing with many different universities, different personalities, different issues. And I handle them well. Uh, Doc, my question might be a bit long, but it's um, around the career path for professional and administration staff. Keep it short, Doc. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, in the presentation, uh, you touched on the development and training of professional and administration staff, and possibly converting the interested uh, colleagues to academics. But now currently, there's a problem of recycling and poaching of staff between departments because of the career ceiling being created by the system in the professional administration staff. Um, in such a way that you end up, you know, you have only two options. It's either you, in order to grow, it's either you move to another department or you wish something, you know, to happen to your senior so that you can move up. <laughs> so, Practically, how are you going to ensure that there's a clear career path for professional administration staff to break this? <coughs> Thank you. In the first moment, let's talk about the the future. I just, we need to comply with that. So the career path thing and all that, there must be professional planning. And uh, like we have it in another place. And before you even look outside, and it's not just, it shouldn't just be a nominal a piece of paper that is there for compliance that you report to the department. You need to say, if there's a position in the department, of course, people must qualify first, right? But if there's a position in the department, you have to look for the best. And then give those people preference. It's only after you've failed, you've exhausted all the other ideas that you can look for those people. And it has to be managed very effectively. We have space to take one or two more final questions. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Doc. <coughs> uh, the, among the many challenges uh, faced by, more especially, professional and admin staff, is what we regard as the island or gap in terms of treatment, where many of us feel that uh, most of the mean and support staff are second class citizens as compared to others, whilst we support the project or the core business of the institution. The question is, and this is the first part of the question, how do you intend uh, uh, assisting in bridging that gap so that we all feel that we are special in our own way, inclusively on both sides. The other question is, the relationship between, between uh, organized labor, workers, and the management of this institution is governed by certain frameworks as well as policies that regulate the relationship. It is at one level or the other where you have found that uh, there are protests by workers or strikes that workers may have felt that no one is listening to, to them or no one is acting around what, or positively or in the interest of the workers, well-being or at any other level. How do you intend uh, harmonizing that arrangement? But also let me 
in the last part so that we don't come back for a follow up. Um, Vets University Coast in Sosi has seen a growing number of deaths, more especially from the admin and support staff. 1,500 to 2,000 of those are not on medical aid. One of the reasons is that they were either exempted from taking medical aid because they are any below 205 per annum, or they chose not to take medical aid. So we're talking staff wellness. How are you intending to assist? Focus <coughs> us on that. Thank you. It's a long and a long question. I hope I remember. But I think the key is, is, is uh, it's, it's engagement and engagement, communication. It's to make other people see the work that others respect you. For example, you mentioned that the uh, business staff have not varied that much. But I can tell you, in fact, in that presentation, I emphasize that each and every individual is as important on the I emphasize that labor is a collective, it's key to the academic project. So I think you need to emphasize that. Even all the, the top academics will not be able to publish those like about the papers or every any student without assistance starting from the bus control, starting from cleaners. All those people are important part of the value chain that help this university to be where it is. And in terms of, uh, yeah, the one I spoke of, it's, it's, it's key, that's why I, I also, I said it first. I said vets cannot train doctors and clinical specialists and fail to provide adequate either of the support. So from that, given that the vets has capacity of uh, healthcare workers, it must be a way of providing uh, uh, medical aid at, at, at the state hospital and other ports. At, a, at, at an affordable rate. And then the last part of the question was long, you see, that's what... Employee wellness. Yeah, I think I've, I've just covered that, so employee wellness. That to that vet has a... Harmonizing relations in relation to policies that governs the relationship. Yeah, I think the harmonizing, well, I think the policy needs to be looked at. You see, there needs to be reviewed if there's a need, so that there's that harmony. Dr. Carty, thank you very much you know, for the presentation and the questions. And um, looking forward to seeing the supplement with the committee. Uh, colleagues, now there's the pre arranged co uh, constituency meetings. I think you said they're on the third floor. Uh, just to remind uh, your colleagues, there are facilitators for those uh, you know, uh, constituency meetings. Uh, for academics, it's uh, Professor Majorsi. For professional and admin staff, it's Dr. Stanley Ofu. And for student, it's Ms. Uh, Fatima Daher. That's going to be uh, from now until uh, you know, 1 o'clock. And uh, we expect if there are any further uh, input and questions that uh, the various stakeholders would like to raise. Uh, please, can I have uh, those appointed uh, Thank you, colleagues.